so um, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this session of Data Science Festival um, Summer School Edition. Um, my name is Neil and I'm a, a data science engineer at Dunhumby working in our category management research data science team. Um, so the theme of today's talk is going to be a little different from a regular data science festival talk. Um, I won't be talking about a specific machine learning model or a data science analysis technique. And instead, I'll be outlining approaches and strategies for optimizing data science workflows, specifically running Apache Spark um, applications at scale. So whether you're an engineer, um, a data scientist, or a technology enthusiast eager to learn about performance optimization, this talk should equip you with a coherent strategy for optimizing your data science jobs leading to faster, more responsive and cost effective um, data processing in your projects. So data is all around us. It's estimated that the size of the digital universe was around 100 zettabytes by the end of 2022. Um, so that's 100 trillion gigabytes, amounting to a single bit of data for every star in the physical universe. So this diagram shows um, some historical estimates for the volume of digital data created and a forecast for the coming years. So the point here is that we have a lot of data and we aren't getting rid of it. So we need a way to store and process increasing amounts of data. But why is this important for data science? Why should you care about this when writing your code? Well, to answer this, I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of a data scientist working with big data. So let's say you've spent considerable time meticulously crafting a model that's capable of extracting insights from your data. Your hard work is paid off and your model seems to be working well. But as you prepare to operationalize your model, there's a problem. When it comes to scaling, your model stumbles. So in this scenario, the complexity and sheer volume of real world data demand attention. So for example, generative AI has become hugely popular over the last few years. Um, the size of these models and the data, the amount of data used to train them continues to grow rapidly, racking up huge compute costs for organizations hoping to leverage their own bespoke models. So in an era defined by an explosive growth of data, organizations across a multitude of industries are gra uh, grappling with this challenge. So this is where optimization becomes important. Um, the transition from a data science model to a seamlessly efficient application processing huge volumes of data requires a deep dive into runtime performance, fine tuning and resource allocation. Okay, so how do we tackle this? Well, there are a host of tools and software that exist to enable um, efficient data processing and storage. Apache Spark with its in-memory processing and distributed computing capabilities. Databases like Apache Cassandra and Amazon Redshift offer optimized storage and retrieval for large scale data. Frameworks like Apache Flink enables real-time processing. And Apache Kafka supports data streaming and event processing. So all these pieces of software along with cloud-based uh, provider solutions, AWS, GCP, and Azure, are all important tools to achieve optimization and scalability for data processing. But in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on Apache Spark. Although it's important to note that the concepts and strategies explored in, in this talk are transferable to other pieces of software. Okay, so before I continue onto the specifics um, of Spark, it's time for some audience participation. So to get an idea of the level of famili familiarity with Spark, I'd like you to answer this question. Have you used Spark or another large scale data processing software in your projects? So I think you should be able to answer or submit your answer in the poll section of the call. So I'll just, um, we'll just leave that open for a minute or so just to, just to let you put in your answers.
Okay, and then once uh, once we've got some answers, I think Maddie is able to share the results of the poll. Okay, cool. Um, so it looks like 39% uh, have used Spark or some other similar software and 61% haven't. So great, thanks for, um, uh, thanks for taking part in that poll. So for those of you that um, have used Spark um, or equivalent um, data processing software, you'll find the strategies outlined in this talk applicable to your use cases. And for those that haven't, um, well, you're actually in an excellent position to achieve some runtime savings by adapting some of these strategies we'll discuss in your own projects. But regardless of whether you've used Spark or not, I'm sure many of you can relate to the experience of sitting around waiting for your code to finish running and through something like performance optimization, um, you have the opportunity to reduce this waiting time, enabling faster iterations and quicker results. And this is kind of a crucial aspect that in my experience is often overlooked. So the time saved in each individual run might appear negligible, um, but these accumulations translate into substantial time and cost savings in the long run. Okay, so what is Spark? And why is it so good at processing large amounts of data? So the key difference from traditional computing that Spark enables is the ability to distribute a workload across many machines in a cluster, enabling parallel computation. So this is achieved by splitting up data into small chunks called partitions, allowing them to be processed independently across the worker nodes in a cluster. So to achieve this, it requires two important concepts, and they are resource management and task management. So what do I mean by uh, resource management? Well, resource management refers to the act of allocating and distributing memory across many machines in a cluster in the most optimal configuration possible. So what's really nice here is, is that makes Spark flexible. So extra nodes can be added at any point if required, and then they can be removed again if not needed at any point throughout the lifetime of an application. And task management refers to the orchestration and individual data processing tasks, essentially coordinating the data over the cluster of worker nodes. So another um, important point to note is the distributed infrastructure allows Spark to perform computation in memory, avoiding costly and slow operations um, of reading and writing to disk. So in general, the user doesn't need to know the specifics of these processes. Um, Spark's case Spark takes care of it under the hood. However, to fully take advantage of the resources available, it's necessary to understand the architecture to be able to diagnose and fine tune your application. So the strengths that make Spark attractive for processing large amounts of data also require us to adopt strategic approaches to ensure we're making the best use of the resources available. Okay, so we know that um, Spark is particularly good at processing large amounts of data, making it ideal for industries where data volumes are large. So here are some examples of the kinds of industries that Spark is suited to. So e-commerce, um, Spark powers personalized product recommendations for e-commerce platforms like Amazon and eBay um, by processing huge amounts of clickstream data. And in finance, um, Spark underpins real-time uh, risk assessments by processing vast amounts of financial data used by companies like PayPal and JP Morgan. Uh, in healthcare, Spark accelerates the analysis of medical images um, for diagnostics and is also used in genomics research. And finally, uh, in retail. So Spark drives customer insight analysis and demand forecasting by processing loyalty and transactional sales data. So um, in fact, this is what we use Spark for at Dunhumby, um, which is my segue into the main section of this talk, uh, which is a case study uh, and performance improvements for Spark-based modules. Okay, so to bring the theme of um, performance optimization to life, I'm going to dive into a case study on a Dunhumby solution um, called on-shelf availability. <laughs> 
So as I said, um, this kind of study, um, this case study focuses on one of our Spark-based modules at Dunhumby, um, which is our product availability analysis tool on shelf availability. Um, but for some context, why do retailers care about availability? Well, approximately 5% of grocery demand is unsatisfied due to periods of out of stock on the shelves. So that's potentially 5% of total retailer spend um, that retailers are missing out on if customers decide to not substitute for another product. And in fact, the first time um, shoppers experience an out of stock, 33% will leave the store without purchasing an alternative. And by the third time they face that same item out of stock, that figure rises to 70%. So retailers miss out on potential sales, um, but these periods also impact customer loyalty. So systemic availability issues will eventually drive customers to exit the retailer entirely. So it's important um, for retailers to minimize these out of stock periods on shelves, which is where our solution on shelf availability comes into play. So now I've set the scene for on-shelf availability. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk about its usage at Dunhumby. So on-shelf availability has been run consistently for several years across many of our retail clients. Um, and it's the PySpark implementation started life five years ago in 2018. Now, at that time, um, it was designed to run for small sets of products. So we're talking about a few hundred to a few thousand products. And over the next few years, um, usage grew, increasing um, across, across our retail clients in 2020. And then a couple of years later, by 2022, the solution was still increasing in usage, um, but was starting to be used beyond the scope of its original design, including being used as a full retailer availability reporting tool, running on hundreds of thousands of products across thousands of stores, which is far beyond the original scope of the design. And as a result, um, users were running into memory related issues, um, which were often causing prohibitively large run times. So we're talking about more than 24 hours um, or simply applications failing entirely. So looking forward into 2024 and beyond, um, these challenges are only going to become larger and more frequent. So cloud compute costs have significantly increased and are expected to continue doing so meaning it's more important than ever to improve runtime performance where possible. Now, it's often tempting to try and solve runtime challenges by, by simply bumping up the memory settings on Spark jobs, but that's rarely a good solution to this kind of problem. Um, it can easily lead to an over allocation of memory, which can prevent other users from starting jobs in the same cluster on shared clusters, um, and is also just needlessly expensive. Um, especially considering rising cloud compute costs. So instead, solving sc scalability challenges in Spark needs to be by design. So these um, challenges were the motivation for this work. Okay, so before diving into the implementation and looking at any code, um, we found it's important to lay some foundations. So these are the prerequisites that set us up for success. So the first is a clear objective, which is perhaps the most important thing to have before embarking on a performance improvement journey in Spark. So the aim might be a particular reduction in runtime or cost or a scale you want to enable. Um, and the important point here is um, performance gains often have a long tail with more and more effort required to unlock smaller and smaller incremental gains. So um, by setting a clear objective, um, you should that should prevent you from going down a performance improvement rabbit hole. Uh, so in our case study, the objective was the enablement of full scale retailer runs of on-shelf availability. The next prerequisite is a baseline or a set of baselines. It's very difficult to improve something unless there is a single source of truth for what that thing is. So for this kind of work, um, this is most likely a repository in source control um, that contains the branch of the solution to be improved. So all experiments or improvements should be done in isolation to this in a separate, separate um, development branch. Uh, 
And we also need to be able to say that our performance improvements haven't come at the cost of um, functionality that we care about. So it's often easier to decouple non-functional changes from analytic ones. So in our case study, um, we created a set of baseline outputs from the default branch of on-shelf availability. Um, and because we want to test our work at different scales, um, several sets of outputs were generated um, from transaction data um, from around 40 products right the way through to transaction data from 100,000 products. And finally, you need to have a way of analyzing how things are running in order to find potential areas for improvement and assess if you're making progress or not. So you need to be able to see how your application is executing, which jobs are the largest, which might be unnecessary, and how data is being moved around um, the executors in, in your cluster. So the Spark web UI is ideal for this. Um, you can investigate the longest running jobs. Uh, you can drill down into specific stages and tasks. Um, spot unnecessary jobs um, using the event timeline, which is an example of which is shown on the screen. Um, and you can measure your progress by comparing baseline jobs versus development jobs. Okay, now that I've, um, I've outlined the prerequisites for success, we can start exploring some of the approaches you can take to improve the performance of your Spark applications. So I've split these approaches out into several buckets, which I'm going to talk through in a little more detail in the next um, 10 to 15 minutes or so. So they are uh, basic practices, which we should probably all be doing uh, by default. Um, it's unlikely that any instance of these is going to be transformational in isolation. But by not sticking to these basic rules, the hits you take on performance will sum into significant challenges. So these are things like making use of broadcast joins, caching appropriately, and removing any skewness that you might have from your data. So on-shelf availability had generally already implemented these basic practices prior to this development work. So any performance gains were found elsewhere. Uh, the next bucket is unnecessary actions, um, which is essentially removing or adjusting code that triggers execution in Spark unnecessarily. Next is filtering early. So the idea here is to reduce the volume of data being moved around the network, which is often the bottleneck for long running Spark applications. And finally, algorithmic changes. So completely reevaluating the approach you're taking. OK, so I'm going to um, go through some of these basic practices in a bit more detail. Um, so the first basic practice is broadcasting when joining multiple data frames together in Spark. Um, now, joining data frames is, is bread and butter in Spark. Um, and the first step of a normal join operation is to move data around the network between executors so that every match between the data frames being joined is physically located in the same place. And that process of physically moving data is computationally expensive. So one way to avoid this is, is um, making use of broadcasting where one of your data frames is duplicated in memory on all the executing nodes. So you can see a schematic of this um, on this slide here. So the smaller data frame in blue um, has been duplicated on all executors, whilst the larger data frame in gray is split up across the executors. So in the right circumstances, this kind of join um, improves overall performance by reducing the volume of data physically moved across the network. However, broadcasting won't always help. And in fact, um, when used inappropriately, it can lead to a performance penalty. So the act of broadcasting has an associated cost. Um, so increasing uh, the size of the broadcasted data frame can tilt the balance in favor of a regular join. Um, that's why you should only broadcast relatively small data frames. OK, the next basic practice I'm going to talk about is um, making use of caching and persisting. So to help optimization, um, Spark uses something called lazy evaluation or lazy loading. 
This means Spark only executes code um, when actions are used. So these are things like um, counts and shows. Um, on the other hand, things like selects, group buys, and filters um, are transformations. And transformations are not executed until an action has been called. So um, lazy loading allows Spark to prepare an execution plan to perform these actions. Uh, so here you can see an example, um, a diagram of one of these execution plans on the left of the screen. Uh, so there are two actions called here, both from a common point in the execution plan. Um, and to obtain the results of these two actions, currently some code is being executed twice. So in the schematic, we can see some transformations in white. So these might be things like selecting columns or filtering by certain values. And it looks like we've got a join between two data frames. Um, and then that's followed by two actions in blue. So to speed things up, we can choose to store intermediate results in memory by caching. So in this example, we can see that we've cached the results of a join between two data frames, which is shown in gray. So you can see the execution plan has been simplified. Um, we can simply use the results of the cached data frame to calculate the results of the second action. So, but as with broadcasting, um, there is a cost associated with storing in memory. Uh, so it's worth comparing the cost, uh, this cost versus the total time saved for your jobs to decide whether caching is appropriate or not for your use case. Uh, but the key takeaway here is it's wise to cache intermediate data frames if several operations use them downstream. OK, another common problem um, in Spark is dealing with skewed data. So the essential point here is that perfor the performance of distributed systems depends heavily on how distributed the data is. So in Spark, data is split up into chunks called partitions. Um, which allows Spark to complete many tasks in parallel, which is why Spark is so fast. Um, but it's, it's important to partition your input data sensibly um, to avoid needless shuffle in downstream jobs. So you can easily run into problems when performing joins on poorly distributed join keys. So to bring this to life a bit, um, let's say I want to join a large data frame um, transactions onto a smaller data frame um, customers um, using the customer or using a customer identifier column here, person ID. There is a disproportionate number of records in transactions where person ID is set to zero. And in this case, that's because zero represents the case when no loyalty card was used. So the problem here occurs when Spark tries to repartition the data frames by the join key. Um, leading to an uneven distribution of um, records. So you have one executor that um, is processing many more records than, than your other executors. And here we can see um, why the Spark, or one of the reasons why the Spark web UI is handy. So it's a handy tool to troubleshoot issues like this. So if you see the um, uh, maximum task execution time here, which is 2.3 minutes. If you compare that to the medium, which is two seconds, there's a really big difference there. And um, that is one of the warning signs that you have skewness in your data. So that kind of hints that the, the um, one task probably processed much more data than the others. OK, so there are, there are a few ways to deal with this in Spark. Um, First of all, you should ask yourself whether or not you even need these values in your analysis. And if not, just filter them out as early as possible. Uh, luckily, Spark can do some of this automatically. Um, it uses something called adaptive query execution, which can help with skewed conditions. Um, and then once enabled, Spark is able to analyze data at runtime and split skewed partitions into smaller partitions if necessary. But if for whatever reason, Spark isn't dealing with SKU well automatically, um, you can use salting um, to help. So in this code snippet here, um, you can see salting in action. So the idea is to add some randomness to the skewed values in your data frame. So in, the, in this case, that's when the person ID column is equal to zero. Uh, 
um, which helps Spark to execute those tasks in parallel. So as you can see now, this is the um, Spark Web UI after uh, this change was made. So the maximum task execution time is six seconds and the median is three. So um, our tasks are much more balanced. So it looks like we've we solved the, the skewness problem. Okay, so now I've gone through some of the basic practices um, which we should all be doing by default. And now I'll move on to the next bucket, which is um, unnecessary actions. Uh, basically, that's, that means stop doing the things you don't need to do. So one of the simplest um, and quickest ways of improving performance in an application is simply to do less. So that might sound really trivial, um, but often code added during development is never removed. For example, checking the number of rows in a data frame. So this results in unnecessary operations making their way into production workflows. And the worst offenders for this kind of category are any operations that trigger code execution, which in Spark are typically um, count and show actions. So the good news is that these are relatively simple to fix and relatively low risk, meaning they're ideal candidates for performance improvements. And this was exactly the case for on-shelf availability. Throughout the code, the size of intermediate data frames were periodically checked before applying some logic. So an example of this kind of thing is shown on the code snippet on this slide. So in all these specific cases, the logic applied could tolerate an empty data frame without raising an error. And as discussed earlier, um, count operations are actions which trigger code execution. So in our case, um, some proportion of the total runtime was dedicated to performing these count actions completely unnecessarily. And now it's important to note that um, this is um, often a, a really simple change to make, but it can make a huge difference to your total runtime. Um, these kinds of changes are really low effort for potentially a decent chunk of improvement. OK, um, another approach you can try is replacing specific joins with window functions in Spark. So for some context, um, window functions calculate a value for every row in a data frame based on a group of rows. So uh, for example, let's say we've got a data frame with rows of transactions uh, with a customer identifier column and a spend column, which you can see on this slide. Now let's say we want to add a column containing the maximum spend per customer for each row which you can see here. Uh, but what's the, what's the most intuitive way to approach this? Um, well, that's probably by doing an aggregation on the transactions data frame and then joining it back to itself, which is shown on this slide. But instead of doing that, you can do, uh, instead of doing this aggregation plus join pattern, we can make use of the Spark window function, um, which eliminates the need for a join. So this approach creates a window over the customer identifier column and calculates the max spend over the window. So here is a quick comparison um, between the runtimes of both approaches for varying sizes of input data. Um, so the point here is that um, making use of windows um, where appropriate is generally favorable to the aggregation and join pattern approach from a performance perspective. OK, the next category, uh, the next bucket is filtering early. So in most applications, some proportion of the runtime is, is just moving data around your um, cluster in Spark. And that's referred to as shuffling in Spark. So it's really important to reduce the data volume as much as possible to reduce shuffle. If you only need a subset of columns, you should only keep those columns, particularly when joining large data frames together. So this is another approach that we implemented for on-shelf availability, our case study. Um, so due to the, na the nature of grocery retail transaction data, um, on-shelf availability often deals with data frames where the vast majority of rows do not contribute to the output. So here I've got a diagram to, to try and il illustrate this. Um, so if we just, um, for a bit of context, um, to estimate the lost sales attributed to an out of stock event, we need to be able to estimate the expected demand for a product in a given store. So to do this, um, on-shelf availability builds a demand model 
with a demand estimate for every product in every store on every day at every hour of the analysis period. Now, when you scale that up to full retailer, uh, the maximum size of that demand, demand model has trillions of rows, most of which are filled with zeros. Now, that kind of makes sense when you consider that most products don't sell in most stores most of the time. Um, so we're in a situation where most rows in the demand model are filled with zeros, which don't contribute to the outputs of the solution. So instead of shuffling around um, huge amounts of non-contributing data um, in downstream joins and actions, we chose to filter out the zero values as early as possible, um, which hugely reduced the volume of data shuffled throughout the application. Okay, and the final category is um, algorithmic changes. So this is by far the most drastic approach, uh, which com which involves completely reevaluating the approach you're taking. Um, but this this kind of overhaul is often really invasive and requires um, a large amount of effort to verify that the new approach is as valid as your previous approach. Um, but it is the only real way um, uh, to achieve um, performance improvements of multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, but it's not something we considered in our case study. OK, so now I've gone through some of the performance approaches. Um, let's take a look at the implementation for on-shelf availability. So here I've got a screenshot of one of the baseline runs of on-shelf availability. This run took about 20 minutes for analysis of the transactions for roughly 40 products. So I've split out the event timeline um, into four sections. Data extraction, um, which is a section dedicated to extracting uh, um, transaction, customer store, and product information. And as a side note, it's often useful to separate data extraction and um, science for your Spark-based modules. Uh, there's also a count section, which consists purely of count actions, um, which forces Spark to execute code. Uh, shuffle, which is a section that mostly consists of large joins um, causing data to be shuffled around the cluster. And outputs, which is responsible for saving the outputs to the file system in place on the environment where the application is running. So I want to point out two things in particular here. Um, the clump of count jobs, which we've identified as not being necessary and the relative size of each section. So at this uh, level, uh, which is 40 products, the data extraction dominates the runtime of, um, of the run. So it looks like about 60% of the runtime is down to data extraction. And here I've got the corresponding um, event timeline of a large run of availability. Um, so this was for 100,000 products, which took about six hours to run. So what's important to point out here is the relative size of each section compared to the previous slide. So data extraction no longer dominates. And in particular, the shuffle section has grown relative to the other sections, making roughly 50% of the total runtime compared to something like 10% previously. So this is the issue that filtering early tackles. If you recall the slide where I uh, mentioned filtering your data as early as possible. So you should do everything possible to minimize the volume of data being moved across the cluster. Uh, I've also pulled out some uh, shuffle statistics for a specific job, which I'm going to use to compare um, to the same job in the next slide after the performance upgrades were implemented. So finally, this is the event timeline after the implementation of the performance upgrades. So this run was on the same set of inputs as the last slide. So we can compare some statistics to measure the performance gain. So the total runtime has significantly reduced from six hours to three hours. And as expected, the count jobs um, are no longer present as they've been removed. And the volume of the shuffle data has also been reduced um, compared to the same job in the baseline run. So if you just compare the numbers here on this specific job um, compared to the previous job, um, they've all come down. And um, that reduction in shuffled data sums up 
across all subsequent jobs um, in the application to contribute to the drop in runtime. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we did this exercise for several different scales um, by increasing the number of transactions queried and comparing the runtime before and after the changes were implemented. So multiple jobs were run um, for each scale of input um, with the goal to smooth out any bumps that might have been caused by varying loads on the cluster at different times of day. And uh, so shown in the graph here is the performance of the new development version versus the baseline version. And you can clearly see the growing gap between um, yeah, the, the growing gap in runtime um, for the same number of products, showing how performance improvements often don't scale linearly with input size. So you get more bang for your buck at larger scales. And at the top right of this graph, um, the, the orange triangle, you can see um, the full retailer run um, on the development curve. And the equivalent of which wasn't possible um, before these changes. So we found that on average, a typical run of on-shelf availability um, ran 50% quicker than um, the baseline version. And that we were um, uh, able to enable full-scale retailer runs. Okay, so we achieved our goal, um, but was it worth it? And why is work like this important? Well, the first thing to talk about is cost. So over recent years, um, cloud storage and compute expenses have surged. Um, now with cloud costs set to continue to rise, the emphasis on minimizing runtime and subsequently compute cost is more important than ever. So this holds particular significance for frequently reused um, Spark modules. A minor enhancement in performance, even by 10%, um, through modest development efforts can lead to substantial cost savings for widely reused modules. And next is time. So um, in my experience, Spark jobs can often be prohibitively large to run um, and act as bottlenecks in project delivery. So we've shown it's possible to significantly improve performance, particularly when scaled up to larger jobs, which often cause the biggest headaches. Um, investing some time early um, improving the performance of your jobs is going to save you time in the long run. Even doing the simple things outlined in the approaches slide earlier can make a big difference. And finally, scale. Um, so sometimes jobs at large scales won't finish at all, particularly when there is a large load on shared clusters. Um, and the only way to sustainably enable scalability is to investigate and implement performance improvements. Adding more memory to individual jobs is not the answer. OK, so to summarize the talk, um, we've shown it is possible to um, achieve significant performance improvements in your Spark code by sticking to a coherent strategy, setting up the required pre prerequisites, um, scoping out potential approaches, implementing your chosen approaches, and then analyzing your results. Um, there's a blog post on um, Dunhumby's Medium page, um, which you can use as a reference for the concepts discussed in this talk. And finally, um, I encourage you to tackle performance issues in your own projects, and I hope this strategy helps you achieve great results. Um, thanks for listening. Um, I've left my details on this slide for anyone that wants to get in touch, and I'm happy to take any questions.